If you're not there already, uh, turn with me to the book of John. And we're picking back up this morning. You know, Jesus is still in Jerusalem. I'm going to say that a lot because he came to Jerusalem at the beginning of John chapter 7, immediately following the Feast of Tabernacles. And we're picking up in this conversation he's having. Sometimes you, you wonder, like, why do we slow down in these conversations? Why don't we just zip through? He's kind of saying the same things. And part of, the, part of the goal, I think, in slowing down is, one, let's extract truth from every nugget we can from the Word of God because there's value there. That's number one. But number two, it is a great opportunity week to week to soak and sit and understand the character of your Savior. He cares about men who want to kill him. He cares so much that he goes on and on in different ways to try to explain to them who he is, what he was there for. He wants to persuade them to believe. Last week, he, he, got, he got more desperate, if you want to say that, or last time we met, more desperate in the way he communicated because he told them some things directly. He says, you are going to die in your sin. You're going to die in your sin of unbelief. If you don't trust in me, you're going to pay the penalty for your sin. And then he also went on to say, you're going to die connected to your sins, or he's going to die in your sins, connected to the acts of sin that actually dictate the fact that you and I deserve the judgment of God. He says, if you don't believe, you're going to die connected to those facing the wrath of God when you didn't have to. And these men, probably as they're listening to him, they're just gritting their teeth, wanting to get their hands on him. They hate him so much and that he loves them so much. And one of the reasons I believe, and you see the title of the message this morning, one of the reasons I believe Jesus is spending so much time and so much energy and, and just devoting so much passion to come at them from different angles is because ideas have consequences. Do we understand that? We understand that from a political perspective, right? You put somebody in office, their ideas are going to have consequences. They make policy based on what they believe. What a person believes affects what they do. But even more importantly than that, in the area of eternal life, what somebody believes has eternal consequences. That's what, why this is serious. This isn't just the game we try to play on Sunday where we, we try to dance a jig and just kind of entertain everybody for a week and blow smoke machines and, and put on a rock show that you, that you somehow check out of reality for an hour and you're like, oh, that was very positive. The world's so negative, that was very positive. That's not why we're here at all. It, honestly, this is the message that can change a human being's eternal destiny. I'm, we're not talking about the next five years of your life. We're not talking about living your best year now. We're not talking about having the best 2024 that you can have. Fooey on 2000. I mean, fooey on one year of your life. We're talking about eternal destiny. This is why Jesus, in just looking at what he's talking about, is like, man, this guy cares. This guy loves like nobody loves. I know that somebody doesn't like me, and I'm looking for the door quick. I just want to get out. I don't want to talk to you. If you don't like me, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I, you know, that's something I learned in middle school, right? If a girl doesn't like me, I'm not telling her I like her. <laughs> I mean, come on. Jesus is willing to take the brunt of this. It's just amazing. In fact, as we come to, in, in, into verse 28, it's really interesting because we're really coming out of verse 27. I know that's, that's you know, Captain Obvious there. But look at 27 because 27 really leads us into this passage this morning. It says that they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. See, they were lacking understanding. They weren't coming to know that what Jesus was saying is, I'm unified with the Father. I'm doing the works that the Father has designed me to do. I'm speaking the words that the Father has given me to say. I am one with the Father. You guys hate me, want to kill me, and I'm one with the one you claim to worship. And so Jesus is going to go on in verse 28. And he's going to say this, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. Now, this word lift up, the, the word itself just means to to lift up, <laughs> to heighten, to, to raise up, or uh, to elevate. And we know from Jesus' words earlier uh, to Nicodemus in John 3, 14, he says that, that even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He said that to Nicodemus back in John 3, 14. Still there, you're like, what's he exactly is he talking about? Well, he clarifies for us in John 12. Because he says, and if I am lifted up, or John clarifies for us from Jesus' words, if I am lifted up from the earth, 
will draw all peoples to myself. And then John gives us an editorial comment. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Remember, Jesus had told this very crowd earlier, there's some, there's some here that want to kill me. And they're like, psh, psh, you're crazy. There ain't no one here that wants to, come on, come on, dude. You're overreacting. It's kind of their, their attitude back in John 7. But what's really interesting here, there's a couple of interesting things here. Notice this. I mean, sometimes we read this story, we, we forget about the details that are being revealed. But not only does Jesus predict his death here, but notice that he predicts the manner of his death. What, are these, what has this crowd been wanting to do to Jesus? We're going to see it over and over again in chapter 8. They've been wanting to stone him, right? So Jesus not only predicts that he's not going to die by stoning, he's not going to die by a back alley, you know, what are the, I, there's a name for that. Anyway, cutting of his throat. He's going to be lifted up. That's how he's going to die. He's predicting even the manner of his death, death, and he's predicting the very people who are going to be involved in executing it and getting him to that point to be lifted up. And he says, when the Son of Man is lifted up. Now, this is an interesting phrase because Son of Man, as we've talked about before, but I see, I see some new faces. Sometimes Son of Man, uh, Bible teachers will say that that's referring to the humanity of Christ. Son of God refers to his deity. And so when he says Son of Man, he's talking about his humanity. Um, there's an aspect of that that's, that's true. But I think it's even more significant the fact that he uses this phrasing for this audience. In fact, I think it actually probably confused them more, but in a good way. It, it confused them more to jolt their thinking to say, wait a minute, what are, you, what are you talking about here? And so he says that the son of man must be lifted up. And the fact that he uses this son of man, I, like I said, it may have confused his audience more. And the reason for that is because this phrase son of man is used in Daniel 7, 13 through 14, to refer to the Messiah, but specifically in that passage, it's referred to the Messiah coming and reigning as a king, not being lifted up on a cross. And you can see why the Jewish mind may have had a hard time with that. Daniel 7, 13 through 14, notice I've kind of highlighted that going through. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, it's describing Jesus Christ's second coming which we read about in Revelation 19, in the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, speaking of God the Father, and they brought him, the Son of Man, near before him, the Ancient of Days. Then to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. And now can you see the son of man must be lifted up? They're like, what are you talking about? They're probably thinking, you don't even know your Bible. <laughs> the son of man's not going to be lifted up. The son of man's going to reign. And Jesus is blowing in their mind and rocking their world, so to speak here, because they have not seen this. And this is one of the things that Jews in Jesus's day had a hard time understanding. By the way, Jews in our day still have a hard time understanding this. How do these two truths fit together? Because they're both clearly taught in the Old Testament. You've got a, a Messiah that's going to be a conquering king that's going to reign over a kingdom. All people will worship him and recognize his authority. And then number two, you've got this suffering servant. You've got a Messiah who is going to be cut off. You've got a Messiah who's going to die in the place of others. You, you've got all of this described in the Old Testament. How do these two things fit together? This was confusing, obviously. Now, if they would have taken the, the scroll of Daniel, Daniel 7, right, and just kind of rolled it down a notch, or like today we'd say, just flip the page to Daniel chapter 9, guess what they would have also seen in Daniel chapter 9? After 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And they would have thought as good Bible interpreters, okay, how is he going to reign and how is he going to be cut off? How does that fit together? How does, how does Isaiah 53 fit with this idea that David is going to have a descendant that reigns forever. How does all of this fit together? In fact, if you look at it closely, it looks like an apparent contradiction. In fact, if you witness to a Jew today, many Jews, their biggest objection is this, it can't be Jesus because where's the kingdom? That's their argument. No kingdom, so it couldn't be Jesus. And it's because there's a hard time putting this together. And Jesus is telling him, you know the son of man in Daniel 7? He's going to have to suffer, die, and guess how he's going to reign? He's going to rise again. Then he's going to reign for eternity. And they didn't make that 
connection, the unbelieving Jews. Now, Jews that were astute, Jews that were willing to follow the breadcrumbs, so to speak, that God was leaving them, these are the pieces that started to be together. In fact, uh, we don't have time to do that today, but in, in Acts 17, if you want to just jot this down, Acts 17, one through five, this was Paul's entire approach in Jewish synagogues on his missionary journeys. He would go in, he wouldn't just start talking about Jesus, he would go into the Old Testament scriptures and he would explain why the Christ, the Messiah, had to suffer, die, and rise again. And that's what the Jew needed. They needed an explanation of how to reconcile those passages with the reigning king passages. And this is what Paul did, even his missionary journeys. Now, what Jesus is going to say is really fascinating. (laughs) Because you would think that if these men got what they wanted, they were able to crucify Jesus, story over, they'd be done, they'd be justified, they just move on. Jesus is gonna say, when you lift me up, you're actually gonna come to know some things. There's some things that you're gonna gain some knowledge of when you lift me up on the cross. Notice, the lifting up of the Son of Man appears to be the trigger for gaining this knowledge. And notice it's gaining of knowledge of who Jesus truly is and how he's been able to accomplish his ministry. We'll kind of look at that in verse 28. By the way, this is exactly what Jesus has been trying to communicate. But now he's saying, you know what? When you lift me up, I think what he's saying, some of you will understand it. And I think there's a prophetic aspect that all of you will eventually understand it. All of you will eventually come to this knowledge. We'll look at those verses here in a second. But this word you will know, it's interesting. And this is why we started with verse 27 this morning. The same word Jesus used in verse 27 there, though it's translated, they did not understand. They did not come to know. They did not gain this knowledge. But here Jesus says when he is crucified, when he's lifted up, they would come to know the true identity of Jesus. And Jesus says something interesting here because when he uses this word, will know, he uses a future indicative. That means guaranteed they will come to know. And you're like, wow, that's interesting. Did all the people here get saved when he... When he was crucified? No, I don't believe they did. So what is he talking about? We'll kind of flesh that out uh, a little bit as we go through. But there's two things that he says they're going to come to know. Number one, they're going to know that I am he. Your translations in verse 28 uh, will add he. Most of them will have it in italics. Again, as I've said before, if something's in italics in the New Testament, it's either quoting an Old Testament verse or it's been added by translators for translational clarity. They're not trying to wreck the Bible they're trying to just provide clarity. And, and typically when someone says, I am, you're expecting a predicate. <laughs> and so the translators recognize that. So they add, what he's saying, I'm he, okay, I am he. But I think Jesus is saying more here, uh, as we've talked about before, because again, he's trying to communicate with his listeners. What is Jesus saying here? I am, ego, a me, the exact translation of, of uh, the exact Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures in Exodus 3 with, with the Lord and Moses in the burning bush. Moses says, who should I say is sending me? He says, you tell him I am is sending you. Ego, me. same exact translation. I think Jesus is drawing on that to, again, trigger their thinking to ask more questions. Now, we know that it triggered their thinking but it didn't trigger their thinking to ask more questions. It triggered their thinking to kill him, <laughs> to get upset with them, with him. And so we'll see that's going to be the reaction. Now, peeking into the future a little bit, okay, this is what I, I wanted to do. How is this true? Well, a couple of things. Some in Jesus' audience, I believe that we're here this day, are going to be present less than six months from now when Peter gives his sermon uh, in Acts chapter 2. And we learned, from that, we learned from that sermon that 3,000 of these men and women uh, trusted in Jesus Christ that day. As a result of Peter's sermon, identifying Jesus as the Messiah, kind of reviewing a little historical record of his life and works. And he said, this Jesus whom you crucified, right? it's, when you will lift me up, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. 3,000 people believed it as a result of him being lifted up. And so this very group may have been part of that crowd in Acts 2. We also know in the future, going prophetically, that one of the recognizable and convincing features of Jesus at his second coming are going to be the marks of his crucifixion. It's going to be as a result of him being lifted up. And you know, if you talk to a Jew, and and you'll you'll see this throughout um, 
Well, you'll just see this uh, if you have an opportunity to talk to a Jew. And you talk about Isaiah 53, and you ask them, let's read through this. What is this talking about? And they'll say, well, it's talking about, you know, the Messiah is going to suffer for, for us. And, and they kind of pick it up, and they say, now, who does this sound like in history? And you know what many Jews are forced to say? It sounds like Jesus Christ. <laughs> because it, does, it is Jesus Christ. That's why it sounds like him. I remember a, a young lady years ago I was sharing the gospel with, and she had a real problem with the Bible, and a lot of people do. They, they don't trust whether it was transmitted uh, correctly or what have you. And I went and read Isaiah 53 to her, and I said, now, let me just read this passage, and all I want you to do is tell me who this is talking about. And I just read through it, and she says, oh, it's talking about Jesus. And I said, you know this was written 700 years before Jesus was even born? And she's like, no. <laughs> And so there's some pretty miraculous things here. But Zechariah 12.10 says this, that a day in the future, the Jewish people are going to look at the coming of the Messiah. They're going to recognize his wounds, and they're going to mourn because they realize we've been rejecting him. But the good news for them on that day is they will believe in him that day. And it's going to be the result of his cross. Zechariah 12, 10 says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And so Jesus' prediction here in John 8, 28 is not only backed up, by historic, the historical record of Acts, there were some in that crowd that day that believed when he was lifted up. They were convinced of these things, but also this prophetic word in Zechariah. But you know, we've got another point in history where not only some are going to know this, not only an entire nation is going to know this, but when all people are going to know this. That means if you are sitting under the hearing of the sermon this morning, this will be you too. Now you can do it willingly, or unwillingly. You can be convinced now or be convinced then. That's your choice. God will give you that choice. But in Philippians 2, 9, there's a point in future history where all are going to recognize that Jesus is the great I am. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, therefore God also has given, has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Yahweh. He's the I am to the glory of God the Father. And so we see that, that Jesus is correct. When, if he is lifted up, when he is lifted up, then, then people are going to come to know these things about him. The first thing was that he is the I am. The second thing they're going to learn about him is that he does nothing of himself. He says that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things. Do as a present indicative. Now, why do I bring that out? It's because the very things he's doing right now that they are rejecting, that they are criticizing, that they are saying he's wrong about, he is telling them the very things I'm doing right now are done through the power of the Father. They're done because I'm utilizing his resources. We'll kind of go through this a little bit more. It's, it's a hard statement if you've never considered that before because obviously we think very highly of Jesus. He can do it. Jesus can do anything. That's how we typically think. And you know what? You're right. He can do everything. But in his earthly life, he determined not to do anything in and through his own resources, he relied completely on the Father's resources. It's amazing. In fact, the word nothing means not even one thing, not to the least. It places the emphasis on not even one. And on the surface, this sounds like blasphemy, <laughs> but it's Jesus saying it, so we're okay. We're, we're in realm here. But it's, it just doesn't sound right like what we normally think. And, and, but notice what he goes on to say, and this is the clarifying part. The use of this phrase, of myself, is telling because he's not saying he can't do anything. Of course he can. But he's saying specifically he cannot from his own inherent ability and resources do what he's been doing. That he's not utilizing his own resources. He's not relying on his own strength. He's not relying on his own divine resources. He possessed them. He's just not utilizing them on a, on a selfish 
level or a personal level. He is literally living life depending on someone else's resources every moment of every day that he lived in the incarnation. This is what's so mind-blowing about the incarnation. You know, oftentimes we look at Jesus and say, oh yeah, of course Jesus wouldn't sin. He's Jesus. You know, he's the son of God. And we kind of have this attitude like, like Jesus, yeah, well, Jesus doesn't really count because he was the son of God. And the point, is, and I think the point that we need to draw away from this, especially as it relates uh, to the Christian life, is Jesus lived his life on earth the same exact way you and I are designed to live our life on earth. Oftentimes we don't make that connection. How did Jesus live? Completely relying upon someone else's resources. How are you to live the Christian life? Completely relying on somebody else's resources, not your own. In fact, those of you, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I'd, I'd have to raise both. How many of you have lived your Christian life in your own strength, according to your own resources? You ever done that? Don't raise your hand. I, we have. In fact, what's crazy, we even know that we shouldn't, and we still default to doing that. And this is what's so amazing about Jesus. He defaulted into walking by faith all the time. This is by definition walking by faith. Jesus, depending on the Father for the resources to live his own life, to do the ministry that he did, to teach the way that he did, to do the miracles that he did, all of it was lived in reliance upon the Father's resources. That is mind-blowing for me to think about that. And the same type of walk and the same type of living is available to you and I via means of the indwelling Holy Spirit and the Word of God. It's mind-blowing. You know, the day that you trusted in Christ alone for salvation, God placed you in Christ, and that now, according to Ephesians 1, God couldn't give you another blessing even if he tried because he's dumped the whole dump truck load on you already. He, he's not withholding resources for you. So many times we go through difficult times in life. We go through difficult seasons. We deal with difficult people, and we say, I cannot handle this person for one more minute. <clears throat> In Christ, you have the resources to handle that person one more minute and one more day and one more week. And I'll try not to go farther than that because that makes us uncomfortable thinking about it. But, but, but truthfully known, we have those resources available to us. This is what's so amazing <clears throat> about what Jesus is saying. And he's saying this, when he's lifted up, they're going to come to know that his ministry was divine. They're going to come to realize that what he was doing was not of himself. It was actually of God. And so it's very clear that Jesus is subtly, not so subtly saying that the very ministry that they're criticizing, the very, uh, the very person they're trying to kill is actually accomplishing God's will on earth using God's resources to do it. And this is what he says uh, a little bit more clearly in verse 29. He's kind of got this follow-up statement to just kind of show them that he is, he is one with the Father in terms of purpose and, and also essence. Verses 29 through 30, he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Notice again, Jesus, go back to verse 26. He's repeating some of the same things he's been saying. The Father sent him. The emphasis on being sent by the Father is the Father dispatched him, sent him. He sent him on mission. He sent him for a purpose, and he gave him his full authority. This is all encapsulated in what Jesus is saying, and they, I think they get it. So not only did the Father send Jesus on mission with his authority and resources, but notice what else we learned from this. He who sent me is with me. <laughs> right now, as Jesus is speaking, the Father is with them. The Father's got his back. The Father's all in on what Jesus is doing. This is what he's saying here. Typically, when you dispatch somebody, you don't go with them because that's not dispatching, that's going with. <laughs> but here we've got God the Father not only dispatching Jesus, but also remaining with him. Just an incredible thought as you, as you, uh, you know, see it here. And so the word with means in the midst, among, uh, implying accompaniment. Uh, the word implied companionship or fellowship. So this not only communicates proximity and fellowship agreement, uh, but approval of Jesus Christ and his ministry. And this is where I think Jesus is going here. I've been sent. He's with me, i.e. he approves of my ministry. He approves of me. Why don't you? It's, it's a convincing argument that if God approves, you should too. 
You see, he's, again, he's trying to communicate with this. The one who sent me is on my side. The one who sent me has got my back. The one who sent me has given me his full approval. And this is what's so amazing. The very one that God is with, the very one that God is backing is the very one that these men want to kill. And Jesus is pointing this out over and over and over again. Now he says something the same, but just from a negative. He just says, the father's not left me alone. He's not going away from me, you know? Have you ever just really supported someone and then they started going off the deep end and you're like, oh yeah, yeah go ahead. I'll let y'all watch you from over here, you know? It's kind of the idea. And I think what Jesus is saying is, not only is he with me, but he's not leaving me. He's not disappointed in me. He's, he's not showing any kind of disapproval of what I'm doing. So again, not only is he with them, approving him, but he's not disappointed with them. This is all that Jesus is saying. Now, what's really amazing about this is the reason that Jesus gives. Now, go back because I it, it's it's we can just jump right over it, but I think it's very incredible what he says here, verse 29. The Father has not left me alone. Notice that next word for. It gives us the reason the Father has not left him alone. For I always do those things that please him. This is the reason the Father is not sending him away. Now, there's, there's a couple of dogmatic statements or words that Jesus uses here. You know, I said earlier, like, it, you, as a human, especially, you try not to use these superlatives too often because a lot of times you're wrong. You, you're just not aware of an exception. Like, especially uh, early on, and I try not to do this, my, my poor wife, but, you know, arguments with my wife early on were like, you always say this. You never. And that's what I'm talking about. These, these all-inclusive words that, quite frankly, just aren't true. <laughs> They're just not true. Jesus uses some of those here. And it's significant that he uses them because of what they imply. Notice that he says, for I always, not, not sometimes, not most of the time, not 75% of the time, but I always do those things that please him. This simply tells us that everything that Jesus did or said, the Father always approved. Wow, <laughs> what a life. Man, if I'm at 20% on a given day, I'm like, man, what a great day. You know, it's just, I, seriously, sometimes, I mean, just you go through life, you're like, oh my, if I, you know, do I ever reach 20% of always? This is always this is incredible what he's saying here. And I don't, want to miss, I don't want to miss it by just glossing over. I want to bring our attention to it. He says he always does or he do, does those things that please him. And this is a present indicative. Right now, guys, the very things you hate me for, the very things you're getting after me about, I am doing those things right now, and they always please the Father. He's pleased with me right now. And then he says, please him. And this means to be content with, to be dear, or to be well-pleasing. Now, that's not just, that is not that God the Father tolerates Jesus. Oh, here's my son again. I love him, but you know, you know how boys can be. That's not it. He is completely pleased with him. He is dear to him. You know, we say this oftentimes, but you know, when we talk about Jesus, he is God's beloved son. You know, I, I mentioned earlier with the meals and the care that you guys have shown our family, we, we love you. But, in the, you know, at the end of the day, I, I really have one beloved, and her name's Carrie. And then I've got five other beloved juniors uh, <laughs> over there that the Lord has blessed us with. And I love other people, but they are my beloved. And it's so amazing because this is how God refers to Jesus. In fact, what did he say at his baptism? This is my Beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And this is what Jesus understands and knows. And you know, that's one of the things that, sorry, sidebar real quick. It's one of the things that's just a blessing is, is so many times Christianity is taught through the lens that if you, if you don't behave, God's gonna zap you. I believe a much better motivation is to understand that God loves you and he will never stop loving you. And God, if you wanna say it this way, has your picture on his refrigerator. <laughs> And he loves you that much. And, and to understand that you are accepted by the one who has the final say is designed to motivate you to live a life that's pleasing to him. And this is what Jesus understood. And this is how he moved out in his life. And what a beautiful picture. You know, this was, uh, 
the hard thing, I think, for these Jewish religious leaders, they were just on the wrong side of this evaluation. They were just on the absolute wrong side of the evaluation. They thought Jesus was wrong. They didn't know that God the Father had sent him, dispatched him, given him authority, empowered his ministry, and they thought he was worthy of death, but he was worthy of praise. They missed it completely. They just missed the entire boat. And you know what? What's beautiful about this passage, what's encouraging about this passage, some were convinced. It wasn't like they all rejected him. We, we see right here in verse 30 that some, as he spoke these words, it says, many believed in him. At the very moment Jesus was defending himself, defending his ministry, defending his authority as coming from the Father, some people heard, they, they listened, they processed the information, and they, they were convinced. They believed in him. And it just shows us again, you know, Jesus is the master teacher. We see that all throughout the scriptures. Too. Uh, if people were willing to just listen to him, to engage with what he was saying, to, to say, wait a minute, son of man, lift it. Oh, oh, what, do, oh, 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 oh. what do you mean by that? They would have been convinced. He could have explained that to them. They, they would have been persuaded, and some were. Notice, uh, by the way, and I don't want to step on any toes here, but I, but I, but I do want to just notice this. Notice Jesus doesn't give an invitation here to believe. They, they were simply persuaded while the words were flying out of his mouth. They were persuaded to trust in this man based on what he was teaching, based on the message. And I say that to say this, Jesus didn't give an invitation. Jesus didn't lead these people in a sinner's prayer. Jesus didn't bring these people to some supposed altar saying that they needed to commit themselves or walk up front or declare publicly or anything like that. In the midst of his message, they believed. And guess who sees belief? Man doesn't see belief. Man needs to see a hand raised. Man needs to see a repeating of prayer. Man needs to see an altar call. God doesn't need to see any of that. God sees the moment a soul transfers their trust to Jesus Christ. And guess who else is going to see it here? The Son of God, because he's going to start addressing them in the very next verse. He's going to know that they believed. And he didn't have to give an invitation to do it. And, it, and it's, it's time that we stop trying to gin up people's emotions to get a response and simply preach the gospel, which is Christ crucified and Christ risen. And let the Spirit of God motivate people to believe. And yeah, we want to persuade and we want to convince and we want to put together convincing arguments. But the point is the message, not the emotions. We're not trying to ramrod people through a process. We're trying to get their eyes on a Savior who did something for them 2,000 years ago. That's the whole point. And Jesus right here, as he spoke these words, many believed. You know what? I believe that happens a lot. You know, even in Sunday school, I won't mentioned there, someone had shared a, a relative who, who had died, and, and they didn't know if he were saved. You know, the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for everybody in the world is that even if that person trusted in Christ as a five-year-old child and then just re rejected him, didn't go to church anymore from that point forward, that person was saved. Because it's not based on your behavior. It's never based on your behavior. It's based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And if there's some sin out there that he didn't die for, let's look at that verse. I, I don't believe it exists because it says he's died for all of our sins. And so they believed him in the midst of his conversation. It's the same structure that's used throughout the book of John, pistuo, which is to believe, ice, into, or on. And this second time the statement uh, has been made about this crowd. In fact, what Seven, chapter 731, we hear about another group that believed. That's just the day before where we're at right here in John 8. So it's funny. It's, uh, what I love about that is this is another group of people believing who didn't believe the day before. You know what? There's encouragement for your unsaved loved ones and relatives. Because sometimes you think, well, I shared the gospel with them, but they didn't get saved. And I shared the gospel with them, and now they've heard it twice, and, they've, and, they, and they're still not saved. Just keep looking for opportunities. People don't often respond the first time. I mean, here's Jesus Christ giving the message the day before. Some believed, some didn't. Guess what? He keeps talking the next day. Some are like, ah, I get it now. I'm persuaded. I'll, I'll trust in him. And so just an encouragement there. Again, another little side note coming out here. 
So the many who believed, they simply listened to what Jesus had been saying. They were convinced of what he was saying, and they relied upon him and his God-ordained purpose and mission. Now, one of the things that Jesus is going to do here as we go to the very next verse, verse 31, he's going to quickly address those in the crowd. It's, it's so interesting because he's talking to a group of unbelievers, but now he's got a group within the crowd that has believed, and it's almost like he just really quickly gives them a quick discipleship lesson. It's really cool. He, he kind of gives a quick discipleship lesson, and then he goes back to the angry mob who, who don't like him. And what he's going to say is simply this. If I, can make it, if I can make it simple, I mean, Jesus makes it very simple, but if I can make it simple, tie in Colossians 2, 6, that concept, Jesus is going to say, basically, the same way you got saved is the same way I want you to go on living your Christian life. That's what he's going to say here. You, you just remain where I've placed you. You remain reliant upon my revelation. You remain reliant on me, and you go on in your Christian life living the same way that you got saved. And that's exactly what I think he's going to say here. Now, <clears throat> I've used this pic picture before to illustrate this, but this lion represents, or lioness, I should say, that's not a lion. Lioness represents you and I. Now, clearly, if that uh, lioness is, is completely resting or relying upon that branch to hold her up off the ground, in fact, if that branch broke or was unreliable or that branch was somehow eaten by termites and snapped off, she would fall to the ground. That branch wouldn't be reliable. But this branch is apparently doing a pretty good job because she's out, right? She's out. She's completely resting on that branch. And you know, this is, this is you and I in salvation. God revealed a, a truth, a message to us in the gospel, and that written word pointed to the living word. And, and at some point, you and I said, you know what? If I let myself go, I'm going to fall to the ground. But if I rely on this branch, I'll never perish. <laughs> I'll never fall to the ground. This is how we got saved. Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. And what did the written word tell us, the recorded word tell us that he did? He died for your sins and he rose again. We rely on that written word because it's backed up by the living word. Guess how we live the Christian life? It's the same exact way. This is how the Christian life is designed to live. Now, that, that, looks, that looks like a lot of our, our holiday celebrations, right? We, <laughs> we ate a big meal, we sat down to watch a football game or whatever, and this is what we ended up looking like on the couch. In fact, if our family was real mean, they could probably get some really good pictures of us with our <laughs> mouth open and all sorts of crazy stuff. But this, this line is at rest. This is how we're designed to live the Christian life. It's resting on what's been written because it points to the one who enlivens those truths, which is Jesus Christ. And so what ultimately we're doing is we're relying on the Lord Jesus Christ, on his resources, not on our own. And see, this is exactly what Jesus is going to say in the next couple of verses, and he's going to give them a quick discipleship lesson using the word abide. Now, he's going to give a lot more detail on abide when we get to John 15, but let's look at verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word... You are my disciples, excuse me, indeed. And so again, as I said, if we're a quick moment, he turns to these who have believed in him. And what we see, and this is, this is important. I'm going to get technical for just a second, uh, but I hope you can hang with me. Believed is, in a, is a perfect active participle. It's, it's articulated, which means it has the word the in front of it, okay? What that does is it takes the participle out of a verbal context and makes it a nominal context. In, in other words, it's an adjective. It describes the person who's done this action, and it's a completed action with ongoing results. We could say the believing ones or the believers. And so what this does is it just reflects the many who've believed in verse 30. And here's the point. It's not describing ongoing action. It's describing an ongoing state that is true of them. In other words, once you believe you are a believer. That's what it's saying here. Once you believe, you are a believer. And you know what? You remain a believer because you have believed at a point in time in the past. That's what's brought out by the perfect tense. So you're a believer. That state doesn't change. And see, a lot of people think, well, you can believe, but if you don't continue to believe, you can lose your salvation. A verse like this would, would counteract that just from the language. 
okay, would counteract that thinking because it's saying believers. And he said to those who believed in him, these believers, but notice this, once, you're a believe, once you've believed, you're a believer, but notice what does fluctuate. You can fluctuate in and out of discipleship because there's additional conditions to being a disciple. And the primary condition for being a disciple is found right here. It's called abiding. In fact, Jesus says to those who believe, those believers, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Now, this word if, third class condition, just don't worry about that. It's basically the way we use conditional statements in the English. If this condition is met, maybe it will be, maybe it's not. You know, if I lay off the donuts, I might finally lose those last five pounds. And it's conditional. I'm not sure it's going to happen because I like donuts too much, right? It's kind of the idea. It's conditional. So he's saying, if you abide in my word, maybe you will. Maybe you, maybe you won't, okay? And, and he says, abide, which means to remain or to dwell or to live. It spoke of a person remaining or dwelling in a place. It spoke of a, a person continuing or keeping on with a certain activity or a certain state. In other words, Jesus wants them to go on abiding, <laughs> is what he's saying. And if you do this, we, maybe you will, maybe you won't, you are my disciples indeed. That's the result of whether or not we meet the condition. Now, as I said, he's going to go into a lot more detail in John 15. We'll do a little bit here. Jesus briefly mentions this idea of going on with or continuing on with his word. And so what is he just, what is going on here in the context? Well, this group has just responded to what Jesus has been saying. And what is Jesus' quick encouragement to them? Keep on responding. Keep on abiding in my word. Keep on valuing what I have to say. Keep on moving forward with me. And guess what? If you do that, the conditional result will be true. Again, what is that? You're my disciples indeed. And I like this. You are present active indicative right now. You can be a disciple indeed if you're going on with Jesus' word. You're abiding in his word. And I love this because there's no process of time uh, involved in, a, in, in being a disciple. You don't have to go through an eight-week course at this church to be a disciple, right? Right now, if you, if you abide in his word, if, if you rest and rely upon him, you, you learn what you're doing in this moment, you can be a disciple, that condition is fulfilled, thus the result is yours. You're a disciple indeed. Now, one of the things we learn about disciple in the New Testament, the technical term means a learner or a pupil. But in the New Testament, it kind of took on a, another nuance, and that was one who followed instruction. It was one who, made, who took instruction and then adjusted their life to the instruction. They, they received the instruction, and then they made it their rule uh, of conduct. That's what a disciple is. And so I hesitate personally. I know uh, many people feel comfortable. I don't, I don't like the phrase true disciple, real disciple, genuine disciple. You'll hear those thrown around. This, but this is actually a good biblical term, a disciple indeed, okay? A disciple uh, indeed. And so many people, it's so amazing. In fact, when you think of disciple, when you think of calling somebody a disciple, What's so amazing about Jesus' emphasis here is it's, always, it's uh, slightly different than ours. <laughs> that shouldn't shock us, right? I mean, we just don't see things correctly. But when you think of a disciple, if you were to call someone, that, that guy, he's definitely a disciple of Christ, or that girl, she's definitely a disciple of Christ, what immediately comes to mind? Why would you describe that person that way? And I'll just give you a, a second to kind of roll through your mental Rolodex. It's typically because of the activity that they're involved in the, or list of activities that they're involved in. Oh, that person's a disciple, man. They lead Bible studies, man. They pray, they meet with people, they blah, blah, blah. We go on with these lists. What's crazy here, Jesus doesn't go on and on about a list of being a disciple indeed. What does he go on and on about? Relational intimacy and abiding in his words. This is considering, this is like when you show up uh, to a place and you're, and you're talking to your friends and everyone's loud, but someone there that you really respect starts talking and you know what you do? You're like, hey, shh, shh, shh. Matt Brown's speaking. Let me, shh. I want to I hear what he's saying. <laughs> I, I'm just waking you up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you are sleeping. No, but, you, but when someone's important, you're like, shh, shh, shh. I want to hear what they have to say. That's how we should live our Christian life. We're in a situation. We got something going on in our life. We want the word of God to speak into it. And you know what? When we understand what Jesus has to say principally about this matter, we're like, shh, shh, shh I want to hear this. 
I want to respond to this. I want this to be my rule of life. This is what all my friends are telling me to do. This is what all my friends think I should do. But Jesus says something different. This is what I feel like doing. This is how I feel like reacting. But Jesus tells me something different. You know what? Shh, shh, shh. Abandon yourself. Abandon your way of thinking. And we want to listen to Jesus. This is what Jesus is talking about. Abiding, remaining, abiding in his word, taking consideration of the one who died for you and rose again, taking consideration of the one whose every word you want to hang on. You ever known anybody like that, that every word you hung on there, every word? That's how our relationship to Jesus should be. This is abiding in his word. And by the way, we see that the one qualification of being a disciple indeed is abiding in his word. Um, one of the things we're going to see is, is in this next verse, two results described of the person who's abiding. Let's look at verse 32. You shall know the truth. That's result number one, and the truth shall make you free. So what's, what's incredible about this is knowing the truth is just another result of abiding or remaining in Jesus' word. This word know is to come to know, to gain, to receive a a knowledge of something. The idea is that if you today will abide in the words that you understand Jesus to teach, guess what he's going to do? He's going to teach you more of his words. You're going to come to know more of his truth. But it requires conditionally a response of abiding. And I love this word know. It's future, middle, indicative. Uh, It shows that it's not a knowledge gained immediately. I wish, don't you wish that God had a download program that you could just buy on the internet and be like, boom, just give me the knowledge I need, you know, like all of it at once. It doesn't do that. It's not immediate. But over time, as you faithfully abide today, he's going to give you more tomorrow. He's going to keep working with you in that way. So you be faithful. Just enjoy knowing Jesus Christ. You think you know him, but trust me, if you dig in, and continue to pursue him, he is going to blow your mind how much he wants to teach you about himself. So he's amazing that way. He's an infinite being. You've never known an infinite being. You know, you think because you know, you know your wife's or husband's dinner order when you go out to dinner, oh, I know her pretty well. <laughs> you don't, trust me. We, we can talk about that another time. But having an abiding mindset is the key component to learning and coming to know the truth. You know, an abiding mindset on Jesus' words means simply this. I'm convinced that there's nowhere else I want to go, and I'm convinced that there's nowhere else I can go. Are you there today? Seriously, on on a personal challenge, are you convinced of that today? Can you say with the Apostle Peter in John 6 what he said? He answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is abiding. This is realizing you you got nothing outside of Jesus. In fact, if you're not convinced of this truth, you'll run to something else every time. By the way, if you are convinced of this truth, your default mode will be to run to something else every time. Still, oh, what's wrong with us? You know, in that sense. But you know, when we're convinced that all we need is found in Christ alone, we want to, we'll, we'll grow in our understanding of more and more truth. If we're convinced that all we need is Christ alone and we want to abide in his word, we'll come to the knowledge of additional truth. This is what Jesus is saying. There's another uh, real practical result here as as we close out this morning in verse 32. And very popular verse, right? We quote it a lot. Um, You know, contextually, it's found right here in John 8. So knowing and relying upon the truth of Jesus' words, abiding, has the real practical effect of making a person free. It means to liberate somebody from dominion. It means to cause to be released. It's a future active indicative. It means it's a guaranteed promise that as you abide in truth, you will be set free. Okay, and, the, and so the question is, what, set free from what? <laughs> that's, that's really the question that we're talking about here uh, in this passage. And so a couple things. The fact that it's uh, future tense indicates that Jesus viewed his believing audience as under dominion and needing deliverance right now. In fact, that's what his unbelieving audience is going to pick up in verse 33. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants have, uh, have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? So to Jesus, for Jesus to say you will be made free, he was actually insulting the prideful, arrogant ones that didn't realize they were under dominion or domination by something. But it's future tense, okay? They, he's implying they needed deliverance right now that they didn't have it yet, 
Um, but what we're going to see is the future tense. I think Jesus is calling to mind his work that he's going to accomplish in about six months' time. And you know, when Jesus died on the cross, there were multiple deliverances that he provided, multiple liberations, if you will. And we want to kind of talk about those this morning because I think it, it, it adds value. When you think of Jesus Christ and you think of all the accomplishments that he that he accomplished. We oftentimes we think about his life, we think about his miracles, and those are pretty impressive. But we also want to think about the accomplishments of the cross, because oftentimes we talk about the cross, but we don't really uh, exalt it maybe uh, as much in our thinking as we could. And one of the things we need to understand is that on the cross, Jesus provided multiple deliverances. And, I, and I'm going to get back to John 8, 32 in a second. Let me just go topical for a second. Some were immediate an immediate deliverance based on a one-time moment of faith. Some were, uh, some is a, uh, were process-oriented deliverances based on repeated responses of faith, okay? Now, what am I talking about? Well, the first deliverance that, that often we talk about here because we want people born again. There's no point in talking about living the Christian life if you're not even wired for sound. You know, you're not even in the family. So we talk about this one a lot. He delivered anyone who believes in him one time from the penalty of sin. That penalty was death. He paid that penalty in full for every man, woman, and child. And this is a one-time moment of faith. It's not process-oriented. You know, some that think it's process-oriented, it's like, well, when you believe, you get 50% of Jesus' death to your credit, and then one year of faithful service, you'll get an additional 1% until the day you die. That's not how it works. The moment you believe, you got the full benefit of his death for you. And, and did he die for all of our sins or not? He did. He paid the penalty in full. He said he paid the penalty in full. Tetelestai, it is finished. He paid it in full. And so you get the benefit of that deliverance the moment you believe. That's why God can say you will not perish and you have eternal life. He can make those promises based on the finished work of Christ as it relates to being delivered from the penalty of sin. One that kind of goes along with that is being delivered from the presence of sin. We call that glorification. That means that God began a good work in you. He will complete it. That's glorification. And one day he won't, uh, he won't have only delivered you from the penalty of sin. He will deliver you from the very presence of sin. We all look forward to that day. Yeah, where our bodies are free from the influence of sin. But the final deliverance, and this is what I think Jesus is talking about in this passage, because it fits with abiding. It fits on ongoing responses, uh, is this. He continues to provide freedom from the power of sin in our daily life. And this is the freedom that you will experience if you learn to abide in his word. This is what he's telling his audience here. And this type of freedom, as we've mentioned, <clears throat> is experienced through an ongoing, moment by moment, day by day, ongoing responses of faith. <clears throat> now, we're going to see next week, uh, we're going to get the response from Jesus' unbelieving audience. They didn't like this. They're, they're getting more and more mad by the second, okay? They're not going to like this because now Jesus has basically insinuated, you think I'm a slave. And Jesus is going to kind of work through that again, being patient, communicating, still attempting to persuade and convince, even though the temperature in the room is going, you know, above the thermostat at some point here in this conversation. Let me close this with a word of prayer. Lord, I do thank you for um, your word, and I thank you for the look, just this uh, a brief look again into the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. We so uh, appreciate seeing his heart, uh, even for people that hate him, um, in this conversation, and we, we just thankful for these truths. Lord, our heart's desire as we walk out of this building today is can we, we want to abide more consistently in you. We want to enjoy you. We want to enjoy the resources you provide us. We want to Learn what it means to <clears throat> just rely on you and stop relying on ourselves. Would you teach us that, Lord? Would you teach our hearts, everyone that's listening this morning, Lord, that's in agreement, would you teach our hearts these truths? And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.